fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, uh, we have uh, Alec Clues. Uh, Alec is a developer relations, uh, I can't say that, DevRel advocate. It's too late here in Melbourne. Uh, he works with Papercut Software, uh, and Alec is going to be talking to us about writing API documentation for diverse audiences. And I'm told there's something to do with floppy disks that we will uh, we need to ask him about. So, um, uh, Alec, um, over to you, mate. Uh, if you can just say something so I can uh, make sure your audio is on. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Akil. <laughs> Fantastic. Over to you then. Okay, so I think Akil's re referencing the fact that. Uh, I first downloaded Linux uh, many years ago from CompuServe on three floppy disks. So that's, and I'll talk a bit more about my history in a minute. Um, okay. So I'm speaking to you from Australia, and as this customer, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wundudgeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So just a few words about me. As I mentioned, um, I'm old enough to have been using floppy disks and in fact hard disk cartridges before that. I've been in software now over 30 years as a consultant and I'm currently the developer relations advocate at Papercut Software in Melbourne. So we're, we're a, a sort of a medium-sized software house. We consider ourselves to be quite agile. I'll come on to that later on. Uh, and we've got partners, uh, development partners as well as customers all over the world, uh, which is why I talking about accessible uh, API documentation is close to my heart. Um, hey, Alec, a lot of time. Uh, I'm really sorry. So your uh, your microphone, I think, is not working super well. So you're coming okay. through a little bit muffled. Um, I don't know if you uh, need to be closer to the microphone or if you can maybe unplug the Does headset. Does that improve it at all? Not much. OK. This is a new laptop. My laptop broke yesterday. Ah. OK, so I think Alec might have accidentally hit the leave button. <laughs> Again, I'm sure you'll be back on soon. Hi, everyone. My name's Alec. Uh, I am. No, I'm just kidding. I am not Alec. But I believe Alec and I share one thing, which is that we are both based in Melbourne, um, which is the home of the Wurundjeri people. Um, so it's a, it's a very common uh, Melbourne thing to, to put the, the First Nations uh, people up. So we'll just give him a, a minute here and, uh, and hope he joins again. I'm told he should be on soon. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Super clear. Oh, oh yours. Take it away, please. Uh, I think the the video uh, is there a way you can turn your camera on though? Well, uh, oh yeah, without, without hitting the leave oh. button this time. Okay, ah, there you are. Right, I, I do apologize. I don't. I, it suddenly I muted. It muted me and stopped the camera without me noticing. Um, okay. Right. Sorry. Yes. Uh, you'd think after thirty years I I could manage these computers a bit better, but um, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, I really like technology, and I love uh, showing people how to use it properly. Uh, and I also quite like coffee because I live in Melbourne. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me after this, I, I'd like to have a conversation with you. You can reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. Uh, so that would be pretty cool. Uh, and I've now, of course, lost three precious minutes from my 20. So let's talk about why API documents are important or accessibility for API documents is important. Uh, and none of my slide transitions are working properly. Um, so the differences, cultural differences between individuals and teams affect the way that people understand the information. So poorly understood API docs uh, are going to increase the support cost because people can ask more questions in the various forms that you provide them with. Um, and eventually, when people get fed up enough because they don't understand your documentation, then it's going to stop using it. So they'll stop using your API. 
and then move on to somewhere else. So that's a pretty a pretty bad outcome. You don't want that. Um, so I've only got 20 minutes. In fact, I've got less than 20 minutes now. Um, uh, so I really wanted to emphasize right up front that I've actually provided lots of uh, further information. And all I'm going to be doing, or all I can do now is highlight a few things and talk, make some general comments. And really, I'm providing this further information so you can follow up with, with research later. Uh, I know that uh, API days are going to be showing these slides. So I do encourage you to come back and, and do your own research. Uh, so these these are here, and, and I'm going to be referencing uh, some of these resources during my talk. Okay, so let's talk a bit about culture. So culture is actually it's not just about language, it's not just about who you where you grew up. Uh, it's about the education system you're in, it's about who your parents are, uh, and then once you become into the workforce and you start working in an organisation, then that organisation has a culture, and the teams and the people communicate in a particular way, and of course. Underneath that, there's you as an individual you and, and your partners as individuals who bring their own unique attributes and perspectives uh, when they work with you. So you've got to take some of these things into account when you just start designing content. Now, in a software development environment, there are various, there are additional aspects to culture besides just the obvious things like the written spoken language that people use and the way they behave based on where they came from and, and how they were brought up. Um, the teams that they're in are using specific tools and processes and languages. Uh, as an example, uh, when I work with people, if they come from a, what I call a JavaScript culture, uh, they will struggle to, to understand uh, me because I'm talking often using terminology uh, and practices that are not common in the JavaScript world. Um, so that creates problems. Uh, and I've also discovered that the way that people view their customer relationships and view the perspective on the software or the, or the value that the software is developing will impact the way that they understand what you're talking about. Um, and, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, okay. So let's. I'm going to talk about creating content. And if I get enough time, I'm going to talk about distribution and support of content. Uh, so creating content. So... Um, Often, I'm afraid to say that uh, API uh, developers think that if they generate some Swagger content uh, or so something else from from, uh, Java, from Java Doc or something like that, then that API reference is good enough to help their partners develop. And maybe if they provide a few fragments of sample code, that's also good enough. That's also good enough. But it's not. Um, developers need of the full gamut of documentation. They need to understand the concepts you're talking about. They need to understand the types of solutions that you can deliver to the, that they can create using your API. They need to be able to get up and start it quickly. They need to be able to understand how to do specific things. And they need to know how to get out of trouble um, when, when they hit problems. That The good news is that's, that's technical writing. That's an understood thing. And so... We already have guidelines uh, and professional skills that we can we can lean on to help us create good quality documentation. And for people whose first language is not English, we need to do just more of that, more of the same thing. We need to be specifically careful that our terms are um, correctly defined, even the ones we think are obvious. We need to make sure that our language is simple. We don't use long words that maybe. Um, not understood by people who, who you know haven't been speaking the same language as us for the last 30 years uh, and, and these types of things so it's just more of the same more of hopefully what you're already doing to write good quality documentation one way to approach that is to use controlled natural language so a little diversion here controlled natural language uh, comes in two parts uh, and was pioneered in the defense and aerospace industries uh, but it's now used in some software environments and a set of constraints on how you use the language um, and it's also a restricted vocabulary so that you only use terms that can be easily understood, potentially easily translated uh, for in, in your documentation. And there is a research project called the Attempto Project, which I've provided a link for, where you can see an example of this. You will need to put, develop your own project-specific vocabulary, though, and you'll put that in your API, API style guide because your, your API will need a style guide or your API documentation will need a style guide. Using diagrams, diagrams are extremely valuable. Now that people sometimes say one picture is worth a thousand words, I think for, for documentation, the better phrase is that one diagram illuminates 500 words. So diagrams are not a replacement for textual content. They are 
a mechanism for uh, supporting and making your textual content easier to understand. So, you know, diagrams are useful for showing the relationship between components, the sequence of events in which API calls have to occur, um, and how to do error recovery, how to perform particular processes. Um, so, but you still need complete explanations, and you still need, obviously, to put alt tags on your diagrams so that people who are using um, screen readers, for instance, can actually see get some conception of what your diagram is seeing is saying and if they can't see your diagram then they need to be able to get the same uh, information from the from the from the text um so here's actually a very brief example i've got a diagram on the left i've got supporting text on the right they should both almost all the text should be able to stand alone um and not depend on the diagram but but if you do it properly then for a lot of people they support each other. It's often common to include rich media in your in your um, in your diagrams, and they present particular issues. So people like to put lots of screenshots, for instance, into their API documentation, and that's you know they can understand that because when you're talking about fields in an API, you'll want to show where those where that information appears in the user interface, for example. But they do present issues because, you know, images uh, and videos can be difficult for some people to access. Um, it's harder to keep them updated. So, you know, for a video in particular, for instance, um, you know, it takes a lot of effort to make or comparatively speaking, a lot of effort to make. Um, and they're hard to translate if they contain textual information. Um, screenshots can get out of date very quickly there is value in them. So sometimes if you have a complex setup procedure for your API, then a video illustrates that quite well. Um, but again, not everybody can see a video uh, or they may not have access to YouTube. So if you publish uh, videos on YouTube, people not, may not be able to access that. So you still need the textual information so that they can, they can still uh, have some chance of success. Um, but they do provide value. So use, but use carefully. Accessibility guidelines. Uh, so the World Wide Web Consortium uh, have produced some accessibility guidelines, and various people have built on that as well. So like the, the notes I, I mentioned from Mozilla, uh, that's really valuable because you know, these are typically written for people who have uh, problems with cognitive um, impairment or, or vision impairment or something else that makes, makes web pages and other things hard to understand. But people who are from a different culture or, or speak a different or write it, read a different language um, have a similar problem. So we can use accessibility guidelines uh, for the same purpose to make our content more generally understood um, or universally understood. And typically they cover things like uh, the structure of your content, uh, how to use headings and white space to make the structure more obvious, how to perform clear, simple writing. Um, there's also a project called Easy English, which is worth reading as well. That has uh, that has some good 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 uh, tips in it. Translation in an ideal world, we would write the content work first uh, once. I beg your pardon, in our own language, and then we would um, translate it automatically by a machine, and our problems would be over because it would be available to everybody. However, it's hard to translate API documents. Translation often takes time, is expensive. Machine translation is often not being good enough, um, but it's worth experimenting because that, that art is, is continuously evolving. Use of controlled natural language will make translation a lot easier, incidentally. And be prepared for the fact that your readers will just take your content and paste it into Google Translate anyway to see if they can make more sense of it. So if you're able to, um, it's worthwhile doing that yourself to see if you get that something sensible out the other side. Provide complete working code examples. So I've talked previously that you're often the code samples are just mere fragments um, that don't provide a, a great context. So what you really need to do is to provide a working program, not just a sample, but, a, but not just a small code fragment, but a, but a program that people can run. And that gets them up and running quickly. It explains or helps to explain a lot of your API documentation. And when you are answering their questions, you can refer them back to the code. So this working example needs to show how to handle exceptions, 
it needs to show what the type of API calls that happen in real life, not just the trivial ones, but the complex API calls. How to, how, what has to be done before an API call is made? What has to be done afterwards or set up and tear down? Uh, and ideally, you've written decent comments to actually explain what's going on in your code. So don't skimp on a good quality working code example, not just some code fragments. Reference documents, briefly, um, those are easy to generate often, but it's still good to just go through and make sure that you're applying the style guide to things like names, explanations, see if the comments can be improved, that sort of thing. Uh, they can be improved and they are valuable. Okay, let's talk about distribution and support of content. So as I talked about, Papercut considered itself to be a modern agile uh, develop, development house, software development house. We deliver our content online. Um, we do we update and frequently update content, either because of new features, because of bug fixes, or because of, uh, in my case, just bad English that people have noticed and now I fix it. Um, and we do that on a continuous basis. So we just we just make changes, you know, as often as we need to. Might might be once or twice a day if if that's what's required. And we also try uh, and engage with our community of partners through communities, so things like Google Docs or Slack. And we also hope that our community of partners pull the information that they need, rather than us having to proactively push it by guessing that they need, need the content. And if they can't find it, we hope that they'll ask us for it. But um, that, that uh, doesn't always happen that way. Other development type teams might have a different culture of consum consumption. So they might value things like stability, so not frequent updates. They might expect clear signals around when changes occur. So if you're uh, doing minor improvements at twice a day or, or once a week or whatever, then running a clear signal around that can be, can be difficult. Uh, they also expect a regular, a regular release cadence. So, um, for instance, you know, again, talking about continuous improvement may be something they're not used to. They may be confused by you, you know, um, doing a, a change every few weeks uh, or every few days, even when they expect it to come out and, you know, all the changes to accumulate and then to be released once um, in every few months. Getting content online can present problems. They uh, might want to have a delivery of, of assets. It might be a PDF file in the modern era. It used to be printed manuals back when I was younger. Uh, but you know, they they take those and they archive them. Uh, they can they can go back to them. They can you know the very very much from just uh, an informal delivery of HTML content doesn't kind of work in that model. Um, and they expect to have content often sometimes pushed to them. Now, I'm making some fairly general statements here. You, you, you'll get variations, uh, and people will be on a spectrum, but, and you'll see different aspects in different things. But these are the sorts of the things you've got to expect to see. So you need to try and meet people halfway and try and provide mechanisms for them to, to, to work like this. Um, there's also a difference in communication styles. So you know, so some of us are used to using support desk tickets, you know, raising questions through support desks or using online forums. Some some organizations uh, and some cultures, uh, particularly I've found in, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, prefer person to person relationships or send you send you as an individual an email uh, and have a conversation via email. Um, Sometimes people people will feel a lack of confidence in in their use of English with me, and they will send a long PDF document rather than a brief email, which then becomes a bit harder for me to to respond to and manage. Uh, but again, I, you, you make the effort because that's how you work with different cultures. Um, and for public forums such as Google Groups, are often also uncomfortable with people whose first language is not the same as yours. Um, I try and use collaboration tools, so things like meeting software, uh, Git, GitHub for sharing code, uh, office tools, video sharing, all sorts of things. Uh, and we have online developer portals, but that can present a problem as well because often IT departments in larger organizations with a formal, more formal IT culture will block those services or will only permit specific meeting software to be used. Um, we use Google, we Google, Google Meet at Papercut, but but 
that's often not used in, in large corporations who, who are trying to use our trying to use our software uh and and even in some places you know you have you've you built a beautiful developer portal and, it, and it's blocked by it policy uh, and i did mention problems with youtube as well um if you do need to distribute and this is not an advert uh we have a free if you do need to distribute pdfs uh we did develop as a, as a side project some years ago a thing called qr.io which allows you to dist distribute pdfs and update them automatically so you're welcome to try that if you want um and that's about it and i've finished quite <laughs> early oh i've got time for questions that's good I have yeah um, well, i had a fabulous. bit of a panic there because of the because of the snafu and uh, i think i probably sped through that i hope everybody understood me yeah no it was it was perfectly uh uh paced and and timed and so forth so thank you very much for that and uh, yeah, I think uh, in the backstage we were considering actually letting you go until the uh, top of the hour. So uh, you had plenty of time, but there we go. Uh, so maybe I can uh, ask some questions if uh, if that's okay, Alec. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, so look, documentation for me. Um, uh, if you came and asked people that I work with, uh, I consider it a first first class citizen. Whereas you know, uh, a true engineer may or may not care about documentation, perhaps, right? Um, well, a developer may or may not care about documentation. A true engineer probably would, um, in, yes. in the old school manner of speaking. Um, uh, do you have? So you you laid out some kind of principles and so forth, but I always find it's it's great to have examples. Um, are there examples of whether it's you know public companies or? Uh, whatever you've seen that you go, well, they, they've done a really nice job of documentation that people can look at and go, how can I emulate that? So I, th I think I think the example the industry often holds up is is Zero, uh, mm. which is an Australian company. Um, <laughs> New Zealand, isn't it? Uh, but, oh, I thought it was Kiwi. We, we, anyway, yeah. Oh, well, same, same difference. We claim, <laughs> we claim the eight states. Yeah. We're just the eight states, so that's fine. I think I think all the Kiwis in the audience will be after me with pitchforks now. Um, <laughs> now, to be serious, so if you go to the zero the zero uh, website, mm -hmm. that's that's a really good website um, for API documentation. Uh, that, and, and the interesting thing about that is, and this, you know, people have got sort of products that have that are legacy products. You know, so modern cloud product. You know, you've if you've got a cloud product, you've only been in the market. You know, that's only been out there for some time. You, you're using modern modern stuff but if you've got multiple products and they've got different apis using different api technologies because they've been around different amounts of time uh, then it's sometimes a challenge and i thought the zero uh, api website was really awesome at giving you an easy access and understanding the differences between their different products and their different apis that's quite a that's quite a trick so if you need if you need to know about that um the slack api documentation is also held up as another industry standard um that's a little bit different because it's more it's less sort of business to business and more more mm. sort of individual to individual if you were um so so those are probably the two examples but but there's some good stuff i work with a partner in london called nexodus mm. and their documentation is gorgeous because it's so simple and easy um they're a they're a niche player in the uh in the co-working space um, right. and yeah their, their documentation is just really simple and really well presented and, and unpretentious and there's nothing confusing about it and it's great amazing well if i if i can ask um i'd love for you to in the public chat maybe just put a couple of those links including this uh small bin uh, in london um yeah uh, i know i'd love to have a look at that and i suspect there's probably several uh folks out there as well so yeah amazing cool well um and, and my only other comment, uh, love that your uh, uh, idea of a diagram was a sequence diagram. That's old school. I respect that. <laughs> well, I I, sequence diagram. Yeah. I think for for APIs, there's mm. there's nothing better. Mm. Um, yeah. Talk so the interaction model. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's interesting. Nexus have updated their API docs. It's still quite good. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Me, yeah, they come to V2. There you go. Well, Alec, yeah. thank you so much for your uh, for your time and presentation. And um, uh, yeah, look, if uh, if you're uh, up for it, uh, I know several folks uh, have put up their contact details in the chat.
um, so folks can reach out and connect with you on LinkedIn and so forth. So uh, I invite you to do that if you're if you're up for it. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you so very much. And uh, it is almost 9 p.m. our time because I'm probably not that far from you. Um, yeah. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and uh, we will chat soon. Okay, thank you very much, and it was a pleasure to be here. Sorry about Thanks, the uh, technical difficulties. It's quite all right. Yeah.